all. And for those, of course, who are watching live and those who are going to watch the rebroadcast, man, what a great day it is to be alive. Um, I don't think that you can take advantage of being alive anything more than just looking up and saying thank you. Uh, that's an opportunity, of course, to just acknowledge that, man, life did not come from you, and it is a gift each and every single day. So today, we are here to discuss how to be the chief of your own healing. How do we become the chief of our own healing? So, you know, I think it's very, very uh, simplistic in how to do it, but the action sometimes that it takes to follow through each individual step is sort of like walking in mud with socks on. It becomes a little bit laborious. And for any of us who want to heal from anything, childhood, adult life, uh, issues in your marriage, issues in your singleness, it takes some work. It takes some patience. It takes patience with yourself and it just takes the ability to understand, I'm not gonna have it all together. So I want you to write this down because we are gonna go through the, these 12 ways in which we're going to focus on healing and more specifically, how to heal the inner child. For those of us who are watching this, you know, first off, I wanna let you know that I do have a background uh, in clinical therapy um, and psychology and so, this is my educational background, and I come from the therapeutic perspective that what we deal with in our life stems from the inner child, the wounds of the inner child. Uh, that is family of origin uh, in particular, of course. You know, so ideally, most would say, you know, even when we're talking about trauma, that trauma began when you were born, like that in itself was a traumatic experience. You coming out, having to force your way out into the world was a, was a, was a traumatic experience in and of itself. And so you begin your life with trauma and then your parents who are also, watch this, who are also growing up as they're parenting you. <laughs> I mean, your parents are growing up as they parent you. And that's a very, it's a difficult thing for us to envision because sometimes we don't have forgiveness with them. But just understand the inner child is where a lot of our issues stem from. So of course, first off, number one thing we gotta do when we're talking about the inner child is we have to apologize to ourselves. We have to apologize to ourselves. We have to understand that life the things that we're blaming ourselves for, like the things that, you know, we are criticizing ourselves for, didn't start with us. It didn't start with, you know, my own issues when it came to uh, how, you know, you viewed men. And, and you know, it, it maybe it became because grandma dealt with grandpa a certain way and dealt with his stuff a certain way and the, maybe his, his drinking or you know, his multiple women or his, you know, inability to uh, maintain a job. Grandma dealt with him a certain way. And so your mom or father dealt with their partner a certain way because of what they seen. And again, here comes you trying to live this life in the best way possible, but not understanding that you have been shaped by generations previous. So when we discuss this narrative and this idea of um, of breaking generational curses or bonds, what we're really talking about here is breaking the habits, breaking the mindset, breaking you know what it is that caused our lineage to be tripped up over the course of years. That's what we're really discussing. Generational curses is just really the repeated cycle of trauma within every generation right all right so but you have to apologize to yourself for blaming yourself for the issues that happened before you it wasn't on you that these things happened now you're responsible for for killing that part so that you are not continuing the cycle 
you're responsible for that, but it is not incumbent on you to have understood why this was happening to you, why you went through what you went through at such a young age. But now that you have, you're at the age of maturation and you've understood, then now you're responsible. They say that the, at least the male, the male brain doesn't fully mature to 25. I think the female brain is around like 18, 19. With that being said, think about all the mistakes you made before that. How, how would you possibly have known? So the first thing I want you to do is to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself, right? Second is to remind yourself how amazing you are. I want you to stop and pause, right? To put your hand over your heart. Everybody put their hand over your heart. Put your hand over your heart. Take a deep breath. You feel that beating? That's life. You are amazing because you have life still. How many people passed away? We just heard of our brother, Kevin Samuels, who like him or not, was somebody's son, was possibly somebody's brother and somebody's uncle. All right, friend, like him or not, you said a lot of things that were insensitive. Um, you said a lot of things that may have been true. But all in all, his life is over. And if he could, and if somebody could, even if he wasn't the best, I imagine that they would still say some pretty wonderful things about him. That at the funeral, I've never went to a funeral where the eulogy is, he was such a dog. Because to eulogize means to speak well of. So he was such a, he was such a jerk. Most people are able to find within a two hour funeral service, a lot to say great about somebody. So even when you're sitting here in the situation of, man, I'm broken. I'm not the person that I need to be. I wish I was better. I wish that my life was better. Understand, what would people say at your eulogy? Would they share the same sentiments? Would they say the same negative things about you? Or would they have a different perspective? Will they understand that you're an amazing and wonderful person? That the mother or father that you are is remarkable for where you've come from. That you have created a business out of nothing when your family didn't come from nothing. And even if you weren't the best boss, you gave someone a running start for the next generation. You got to understand how wonderful you are. Number three, that leads me to number three. And that is you have to calm down the critic because how many of us know that there is a critic that is constantly trying to speak to us. There's a critic who is always and constantly trying to remind us of who we are. not And at the end of the day, what we need to understand when we talk about the inner critic, what we need to understand is that voice comes from a place of negativity, it comes from a place of not looking at us as to who we are and who we can be. And how do you combat that? You combat that through what you say out of your mouth. Whatever over whatever overflows the heart speaks out of the mouth. And that's Bible. What you have to do is you have to work harder at speaking life than the criticism that is coming within you. There's plenty of negative in the world, right? You can watch TV and see advertisements for what the perspective of a certain body type looks like. You can watch Instagram and see what the financial type should look like. All of that lends to the critic in your head if you don't frame it correctly. If you frame everything through the lens of scarcity and not having enough, not having enough shape, not having enough money, not having enough house, not having enough beautiful children, whatever it is, you can actually reframe your life into whatever you want that's negative. But if you chase and pursue a positive mindset on, on top of just life just being hard and critical at times, 
you will then find yourself with at least some balance or in the positive that, hey, amidst my circumstances, I'm still here. Amidst my circumstances, I'm still looking at life through through a beautiful sunny lens because I still got today. I put my hand over my heart and my heart is still beating. I'm able to still see that I have a promising future. I wrote down some goals this morning. And even though I have not realized them all, I am able to understand and understand me here that I am able to see that I have a bright and winning future ahead of me. How many of y'all can believe that today, right? So I want to talk about a couple of different wounds, right? When we talk about childhood wounds, I want to talk about a couple of different wounds. And there's four different ones here. I want you to write these down. There are four different childhood wounds and inner childhood wounds that we can talk about here. Number one is abandonment wounds, abandonment wounds, right? And so many of us uh, have felt, and, and again, abandon doesn't necessarily mean that you were left to die. It just means that a place of security uh, may not have been there, right? And so in your adult life, this is where you feel left out. You have a constant sense of FOMO. You have a constant sense of not feeling included. Uh, you have fears of being left. You have a fear that the person you're dating is going to leave you, you know, for something that is um, that is small. Because maybe back in your childhood, what you seen was when you did something that may have been disappointing to your parents, they may have cut their love off. You may have seen back in your childhood that the minute that you didn't do something perfectly, they turn their, their attention off of you. They criticize you and they were able to distance themselves from you because you weren't doing it the way that they wanted you to. That's a fear of abandonment. Um, this idea of you hating to be alone. It, it, have you ever, you, ever, you know somebody, maybe it could be you, that they jump out of a relationship and they got to get into another one. Because the idea of sitting to myself, the idea of being alone and being with myself causes me a bit of anxiety. I now have to kind of look at myself. I mean, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want that type of solitude or the type of, of pressure socially that makes me feel like I'm not enough because I'm alone. I'm single. So if people are constantly in a relationship out of one and then rolling into another one. They never have time to actually consider who they are because they're always jumping into another situation. Next, guilt wounds, right? The guilt wound that stems from inner child. This is where you're constantly feeling sorry or you're feeling bad for something. Even if you haven't done anything, you just constantly have this feeling like, man, some, something about that is my fault. I feel bad about that. I don't I don't know why, but maybe I should go and try to figure out how I can fix it. Um, you're a person who doesn't like asking for things. And a lot of this is me. Let's keep it a buck. A lot of this is me. The guilt wound. I don't know why I'm I have the guilt wound. I don't know why. Uh, when I've thought about it, and you know, even things like I don't like asking for things, right? It's this feeling of I don't want to take up space because Maybe my mom was dealing with her own stuff. And so now I am doing my best to play small so that I don't add to her list of frustrations. I don't add to, you know, her, her potential problems. So I'm going to play small and therefore not ask for any of my needs. Uh, and as an adult, I typically have grown to do the same thing. I, 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 I play small. I may need to voice something, but I constantly push what I need out the way so that I can make room for others. Um, you could possibly be afraid to set boundaries. You know, you, you feel a constant, you know, need to stay open for everybody. And in doing so, you think that people are going to love you more. Uh, you think that people will be mad at you less. And that is not true. And normally this person attracts people who make them feel guilty. <laughs> I want you to think about that. Here it is. You have this wound. And it's so crazy, right? The inner childhood wound that we have. Oh, my God. The inner child wound that we have, if it is not healed, 
becomes a magnet for what we went through. Because we haven't learned. We it's the weakness of the story of our life. If our if we watch our mother be abused in a relationship. It was something that she couldn't teach us. She couldn't teach us the value of how to pick correctly, right? She couldn't teach us uh, how to get out of a situation, maybe. Maybe she stayed in it too long. She didn't know how to get out. And so, and then we start, we watch the rubber band effect of abuse, apologize, criticize, abuse, abuse, apologize, criticize, abuse. And we watch that pattern play out in our life. So suddenly we get older and there's going to be somebody you date that is going to criticize. And they're going to criticize you. Maybe it's your look. Maybe it's how you come across. Maybe it's that you don't show them enough attention or whatever it is. And you're going to repeat the cycle because you haven't been taught how to break it. So then that weakness becomes the thing that we attract. That makes sense. Trust wounds. Um, this is where this person's afraid to be hurt. So they keep everybody at a distance. Everything's at a distance. And when you look back, you know, over your life, um, your parents weren't safe people. You know, maybe they, you know, were constantly moving you around to different homes. Uh, when you voiced your opinion, they made you feel small or, you know, tried to make you feel stupid. Uh, they didn't uh, allow you to trust yourself. Maybe they babied you. Maybe they caused, you know, a feeling of um, that your security was tied up in them. And, you know, with my son, uh, my, my middle child, I have to do a better job of stopping myself from doing that. And it's because I operate. Oh, y'all getting, getting the inner voice on me. It's because I operate at a sense of guilt in an easier way with him. I don't know why. Um, I'm softer with him. I'm not as, as, as hard. And maybe that's because maybe I felt hard with my oldest. And so now I'm going the opposite direction on a totally opposite spectrum. But I have to understand that if I baby him now, I'm not strengthening him to trust himself later. I'm not building a, a man who is going to believe in his own security, that he doesn't need external validation to move through the world. I am building someone who's going to be pursuing that type of validation from others in order to feel better. Um, and then lastly, we have the neglect wounds, right? And this is a person who they struggle to let things go. They're constantly holding on uh, to this feeling of you did me wrong. They have low self-esteem. Uh, low self-worth. They get mad easily. They struggle to say no. And this neglect wound typically attracts people who don't appreciate them. Or, you know, makes them feel like, I mean, like, you know, who are you? You know, and, and, and it causes this circle, a cycle of chasing. I'm, I've been neglected. So now I'm pursuing people to love me all the time. Like I am trying to get my validation from this person all the time because I've been neglected in my childhood. All right. So those are the four, um, those are the four types of inner childhood wounds. Okay. So was that good, everybody? Was that good so far? All right. So um, another way, right? We went through, you need to apologize to yourself. You need to remind yourself how wonderful you are. Uh, you need to quiet the inner critic. And now we need to find a safe place. You need to find a safe place, uh, whether that is in your journaling, whether that is in your therapist, uh, whether that is in meditation, a place where you can cycle through your thoughts, where you can travel through your thoughts, where you can understand what it is that is going on in your mind and so that you can visualize those thoughts and actually see what is it that, what are these thoughts that are coming through my mind? Like what's, where does that thought, oh, wow, when I close my eyes and meditate, I see my mom saying that to me. Why does she say that to me? Why did I let, why do I still let her say that to me today? 
and journal those thoughts out and really go through them so that you can comprehend what's happening to you. So you can really see and understand what is it that's happening to your life. Find a safe place, find a safe space. Everyone doesn't deserve your story. You have to earn the right for me to tell you my story. You have to earn the right. And I want you to hold on to that. You have to earn the right to hear my story. Not every everyone does not deserve to hear your story because they can abuse it and misuse it against you. And that is partly your fault if you do not vet who deserves to hear it. All right. All right. Paying attention to our feelings. What am I feeling right now? right? Why am I feeling this feeling? How often do I feel this feeling? How long does this feeling last? What's the severity of this feeling when I feel it? I'm a very feeling oriented person. I can tell you when I feel good. I can tell you my body feels good. I can tell you when it doesn't feel good. I'm very in tune with myself because I pay attention to myself. I give myself the room to say, you got to figure this out, sir. Like, I don't allow other people to make me feel better and I need to, but I don't allow that much in my own life. So I am constantly trying to figure it out myself. I'm trying to figure out what are my issues? Why am I feeling this way? Um, so that's number five. So six, tell yourself you have nothing to be ashamed of. But tell yourself you have nothing to be ashamed of. The life you live right now is a life that you're living, right? And because it's not picturesque, it is not the ideal life that you imagined, or maybe it is. But at the end of the day, whatever you went through in your childhood, you have to give yourself some latitude and say, this is where I am. This is the person that I am. You know, I was I was 15 and I had sex maybe too early or I had children too early or anything of that nature. And I used to be ashamed of that. So I want you to find a way to broadcast that story in a different light to yourself. How can you tell that story and reframe it, right? So when I move the frame this way, whatever's in that frame is what we see. If I move the frame that way, how can I reframe what I have been repeating about myself over and over again that does not give me strength? How can I create an angle of my story that gives me strength and not shame. You have to remind yourself that it's not your fault, okay? We went through that before, right? In a certain different way. You have to remind yourself it's not your fault. Whatever you're going through um, that stems from your childhood, you have to work on it. But maybe it's not your fault. You have to work on it. I don't want to absolve you of responsibility. You have to work through it, therapy, um, just working through it, doing the work, whatever you got to do, you got to work through it. But ideally, it's not your fault. Okay. Someone touched you. That's not your fault. But now you got to work through it. Right. If you were abused, if you were neglected, and it's not your fault, but you do have to work through it. You do have the responsibility of healing from it. Right. We can't stay in a stuck place. The Bible talks about the man who was laying beside the pool of Bethesda and the man was laying there for a long time and he was asked, do you want to get up? Right? Do you want to get up? What a question. What a question of healing. Do you want to get? It wasn't that he couldn't get the man up himself. It wasn't that he couldn't convince the man, but all healing starts with the question of, do I want to? And so many people that we know desire to stay in a place of being stuck because sympathy feels better than healing. It's better for me to tell you the story of my journey and how I was hurt than it is for me to continue to heal through it so that that story is no longer relevant. You have to rediscover a forgotten passion right? Maybe rediscovering a forgotten passion. You've been so numb to the feelings from your childhood and the things you used to love that now you forgot who you are. You don't even enjoy the person that you are. You used to love to draw and color or sing. 
but maybe due to some level of wounds or something that took place, that passion or feeling of desire is so distant. You have to rediscover that. And as you work through that, you'll connect back to that child in a way that is healing. Because how many of you know that the inner child speaks through the adult voice when it's not healed? The inner child speaks through the adult voice when it's not healed. So many of the decisions that we make today, even myself, when I choose not to um, maybe make a phone call or make a decision concerning my family, it's not because the adult version of me is nervous to, it's the little boy in me that is pushing that action away. It's not that you um, are nervous to ask for a hug from your father. It's just that the little girl was rejected. And so now she's still kind of like nervous about asking that. So you have to get back to that, that, little, that little child and talk to that child. Tell that child that it's going to be okay. Because if not, that child will run your life. Um, I'm going to run through these here. We have to do childlike things. Okay? And that that's and play. Play is so important. Play. Lightheartedness. Right now, man, in an age of entrepreneurship, we are so serious. Everything is just so business focused. Making money, grinding, hustling, leveling up. And not much is heard of play. Being playful, being lighthearted is so important, okay? Because it connects us back to the child. It connects us back to the energy, the love, the innocence of a child. And when we connect to that space, we are then in a place of ease. Children don't care much about how you view them when they're kids. They just go and play. And that's a very liberating thing to view when a child is, you know, very free. It's like, wow, like, I wish I had that in my life. I wish I had that level of freedom. But you can have that. You can have that if you choose. But you have to understand that play is a huge part of the healing process. I want you to write a letter. Number 10. I want you to write a letter to the inner child. And... I want you to understand when you're writing this letter that you're not giving it to anyone. That what you're doing is you're writing a letter that kind of puts away some of the wound. This is, we actually work through this in, in grief recovery um, where you kind of seal the chapter of that part. And in writing the letter, you write a letter to your younger self. Write a letter to yourself. Hey, you know, Chris... I'm just here to tell you, man, that when you were young and your dad didn't affirm you when you fell off that bike, I want you to know that it's okay because you're going to fall many other times and you're going to get back up. And so you start having this conversation with yourself as if you're, parent, if you're, as if you're the parent. You're, you're having this conversation, letting this person know like, hey, man, I know that you still beat yourself up over that, but just know that you're going to win in life. I know that back then it didn't look like you were much but wow i want you now i want you and however you write that letter maybe you forgive someone in that letter maybe you tell someone off in that letter and you finally get it out but that letter is important and hold on to it and you don't have to give it to anyone i don't i don't advise you to um unless it's in a safe space or someone that can kind of balance the conversation because it's a very raw emotional letter and sometimes raw feelings aren't always baked in um, in a way that can be received. And we want, we want people to receive them in a way that we can work together to get through that level of conflict, right? So I wouldn't give the letter to the person unless you kind of had a, a situation that you set up that makes sense for that person to understand the letter. All right, so write the letter. And then next, just visualize what it is like to heal your inner child. What does it feel like? What does it look like when I close my eyes and that then that child is now in a space of feeling better? What does that child look like now? If I were working back in that child, you know, in my in my younger self, what are the moments that, that went better? And how can I help my children in that? 
How can I visualize my future in that? How can I visualize my life in that? Um, when I think about the visualization process, it looks like honesty. It looks like willingness. It looks like me taking action. And when I'm action oriented in my healing, then I create a space of growth. I create a space of growth. And that's me. I have to be responsible for that. And you have to remember number 12, that it takes time. This is a journey. This is a journey through life. This is something that is going to take some time and it's not a very uh, easy thing to walk through. But I will tell you this is worth it. It's worth your time. It's worth you uh, crying over your journal. It's worth you doing some long conversations and honest conversations with your parents. It's worth you pulling your brother you know, to the side and, and telling him how you feel. It is worth you, you know, figuring out how you can create some time for yourself so that you can play and, and enjoy life. It's worth it. It is worth it. And only you can create that situation for yourself. You are the catalyst to your own healing. So I want to thank you all, 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 all for being here. Um, and as we discussed, 